What's up, guys? So, Coach, I'll have you give your scout on Texas Tech, and then uh, media. If you've got a question, if you'll just do a quick <laughs> type in the chat and just say got a question and then we'll just kind of go in order as chat is being populated. Um, that way we can kind of have some semblance of, of order as we're going along. So um, coach, if you want to give your, uh, your scout on Texas tech and we'll get this rolling. First of all, thank you guys for taking the time. Um, the initial scout is take a lot of Tylenol uh, cause they're a, <laughs> they're a headache for sure. Uh, they're obviously a very good team. Uh, they're very, very well coached. Uh, Coach Beer does a heck of a job with their entire staff. They're very disciplined. They're very tough-minded. And um, they play incredibly hard. And so um, we're excited for the challenge, though. We know we have our work cut out for us. What a great opportunity. You know, two years – and they have championship pedigree. Two years ago, the last time there was an NCAA tournament, obviously they played in the national championship game. And uh, on a personal level, I was there watching it, supporting – uh, a former player of ours and Matt Mooney, and we'll probably get into that more later. But, you know, when you watch Texas Tech, you 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 go from a sheer exhilaration on Selection Sunday with us being in at large and kind of riding that bubble for a long time. And we were in Las Vegas at our hotel watching the tournament and um, and hopped on a plane later that night and flew to India and, and started watching them play. And, of course, I've watched them at a distance. Uh, over the course of time, certainly specifically once Matt joined the program. Um, um, but you watch them play, and, and I mean, they are uh, very elite defensively. They're, you know, they're going to play man almost all the time. They play a little bit of zone, but for the most part, man, pressure, and get into you. They're going to switch almost all screens. Um, sometimes they don't switch with their five but they certainly are going to switch one through four and that's every screen. They're going to funnel you baseline. Um, they have, a, they have uh, different ways that they'll uh, double the post depending on the game. And, um, and they make life difficult. I mean, they just swarm to the ball uh, in a major way. They force 16 turnovers a game on the season, almost 14 a game in big 12 play. Uh, and when they create those turnovers, um, most of the time, and I don't have an exact number, but it feels like they make you pay and get dunks and layups the other way real quick. So that'll be a big key for us is, is avoiding catastrophic turnovers or pick six turnovers like we like to call them. Uh, we don't want our offense to be their best offense. And, and then on the offensive end, they run. I mean, of course, they have some quick hitters, but predominantly going to be all motion. Um, they're very disciplined that way. Um, they take great shots. They share the ball. Um, they're very balanced and, and they play well off of each other. They, you know, your stance, our stance and vision is have, is going to have to be on point because as soon as you turn your head and you're staring at the ball and you lose vision of your man, they're back cutting for a layup or a dunk. And so we got to be just really, really disciplined on that end of the floor and, and try to make, Life as difficult as possible for them, which is easier said than done. And then you got to finish the possession. They're an elite re offensive rebounding team. You know, they get on the season, they offensive rebound 36% of their missed shots, which is an incredible, I mean, that's a really, really high number. Um, you know, I think both teams are similar in that respect. And so rebounding is going to be a huge key to the game. Um, you know, whatever team can hold their opponent to one and done, I think will be a major, um, uh, a major uh, stat uh, to track that way. So they do a good job getting to the free throw line. And so they put a lot of pressure on you um, from that respect. And then going back to the defensive end, they, you know, on the year, their opponents shoot 41% from the field, which is a really, really good number. So uh, they play a lot of guys, they're deep, they're athletic and, uh, and they're well coached. And that's a, uh, um, that's a lethal combination. So, uh, but we're going to compete, you know, they want to make the game a street fight and they do a great job with that. And I think we do a good job of making the game, uh, ugly. And so, uh, it makes for an interesting matchup. We're excited to go out there and compete and see what we can do against the best. Hey, and Jeff, that, did you we'll want to lead off with that, uh, first question you had emailed? Did you talk to me? Sorry. 
Yeah, you want to lead off with that first question that you had emailed? Okay. Jeff, uh, I missed your background. We need the, the Grand Tetons back there again. Sorry, I could do the skyline of Cincinnati if you want. <laughs> well, that'll work too. That's a little different. Uh, just wondering, Coach, just if you could kind of contrast what you went through two years ago with the normal NCAA tournament to what this experience is like, and if there's maybe a benefit to that because maybe the players aren't as distracted or you're not out in the spotlight quite as much until you're on the court. Yeah, you know, two years ago, it was new for everybody. And um, I, as much as we said, I mean, obviously we came in to compete and try to win, but there was still a lot of like newness to it. And when the guys are talking about, you know, the police escorts and all that stuff, and we, I'm a big believer in taking it all in, you got to be able to enjoy it. But then when there's work to get done, there's work to get done. And I felt like, you know, once we won the conference tournament championship last year, our second year, I've just felt like there was a big time focus. And obviously, um, you know, we didn't get the opportunity to do that. One thing that people forget with our program is we only have four guys on our team that have ever played in the NCAA tournament and only three remain from that team two years ago, right? Brock Miller, Justin Bean, and Namish Keda. Those are the only three guys that returned from that team. So, and then, and then our fourth guy that's played is Marco Anthony, who was on the Virginia team that beat Texas Tech in the national championship game. So we still have a lot of newness. You know, we have, I mean, the 11 of our 15 guys have never been here before. So it's new to them. The one thing I will say that is different, you know, uh, uh, two years ago with the, the, the format up until this year, you know, we got in two days ahead of time. I think we played on Friday and got in on Wednesday. Maybe it was Tuesday night. Uh, but it's kind of a boom, 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 you're on the floor. We've had this chance now. You know, we played in the title game Saturday. Didn't really do a lot Sunday. Had a short kind of practice for the guys that didn't play a whole lot. Got on a plane late that, you know, got arrived in Indy late that night. And uh, we've had a chance to kind of settle in once we got past that quarantine. We did nothing on Monday because we were in – quarantine with the NCA protocol um, practice Tuesday and Wednesday, of course. And, and this morning we, we practice. So we've had a chance to settle in. Of course, there's a lot of excitement and even, you know, <laughs> specifically in that first pass practice, just a lot of, um, I, don't, I don't know if it's nervous energy, a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, but also just kind of this giddiness that we had to get over. Um, and get that out of our system because the guys are just so pumped. And so you get that out of the way. And so we've been able to be here now. Today's the fourth day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, and I think you just kind of settle in and get ready for the environment. Obviously, you know, when you go out and play Texas Tech, they're, I would say San Diego State's the closest team to Texas Tech that we've played just with their athleticism and how good they are. Uh, good, how good they are, period, but how specifically um, how elite they are on the defensive end. And it shows they're both – both those teams are top 25 programs in the country. All right, Mitch, you're next with that question. Yeah, Coach, uh, Mitch Harper with KSL Sports. Appreciate you doing this. Uh, was it good to get a, a visit uh, to Assembly Hall already under your belt to take away the awe factor of, of such a historic gym? You know, it's interesting, Mitch. That's a great question. Yes, um, we, we were able to practice there yesterday morning, Wednesday morning. And, um, you know, I was an assistant in the Big Ten for two years at Nebraska. Both years we played at Indiana. And and Brandon Ubel is our graduate assistant. He played at um, Nebraska his first two years. They were in the Big 12, second two years in the Big Ten. And, um and we walked into Assembly Hall and Brandon Ubels goes, oh, I have nightmares of this place. <laughs> he goes, we got boat trucked my senior year. And we did. That was my our first year at Nebraska. And they were able to win a game. But we had a Zoom call with our team on Monday night, um, just kind of talking shop. Hey, here's the protocols. We didn't exactly know each day the itinerary like we would normally know when we go on a road trip. And just ask, hey, what questions do you have? Going over the ticket situation, right? Just all these different things. And I said, guys, I, I think we found out when we landed where we were going to play and what time we were going to play. 
you know, at one, we found that out, you know, 1 a.m. on, I guess you'd say Monday morning. And we, we brought up and talked about Assembly Hall because besides the two of us, nobody's ever coached a game in Indiana or played in a game there. And, I, and we told like, I, I think we got a really fortunate draw in terms of the location because, and I'm a history major, I'm a history guy when it comes to everything, nostalgia, tradition, um, all of that stuff. And so we talked about that with our team. Um, the rich tradition of excellence of Indiana basketball in the history in that arena and how unique um, that arena is. And so when we got in, they walked us through, like we went by their practice facility and athletic training and all these tunnels. And of course you have the white and red stripes, you know, everywhere. And you walk into that gym and literally everybody was like, wow. You know, cause it is such a unique um, layout, so to speak, and how steep those stairs are in the overhang. It almost looks like a theater with the way it hangs out. And, you know, I think it seats roughly 17 or 18,000 people. And it doesn't really look like that. They're like, you are so packed in. And then on each side, all the bricks and the acoustics in there are so loud. I don't know how that'll affect our game, of course, you know, with the limited fans. But um, we talked about that for I don't know, a decent amount of time it, uh, on that Zoom call. And then when they saw that, that was pretty cool. And um, so it, I thought it was really good to be able to get in there, get a full practice in. It wasn't just the, you know, the the 60 minute practice, so to speak, that you get uh, in a normal year. So it was kind of nice uh, to get that under the belt. And then obviously Texas Tech had the same. All right, Al, you want to fire away, please? Coach, it sounds like your biggest concern in this game and after what happened against San Diego State is your offense. So uh, is, is, I mean, passing the ball and then finding shots against these guys looks like the hardest thing you're talking about a little bit. Well, I'd say it's multi, multi-layered. we got to rebound. I mean, when you're going against a team that's offensive rebounding 36% of their missed shots, like that's high, high level. And they are very athletic. And so <laughs> sometimes you can have perfect position – but they're still going to tip, tip and find a way to get that ball. Uh, and when they get them a lot, just like a lot of offense rebounds, right? You just, you're able to score directly off of that. So that's a big one. And then obviously just on the offensive end, I mean, they, they allow, I mean, teams shoot 41% against them and they force 16 turnovers. So um, we're going to have to be sound, you know, and we've clearly gotten better. I mean, when you have the two true freshman point guards and, you know, a couple other guys that haven't played a lot coming into the season. Obviously, those freshmen are no longer freshmen, but, you know, it's still um, it's still something that you got to negotiate. And I feel like as a whole, we've certainly improved in that area. Um, but every now and then, it re- you know, it, uh, that it rears its ugly head, so to speak. So just finding a way to score. And I think everybody that plays against Texas Tech would tell you the same. Like, I, I just I was next to. Uh, 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 Mark Turgeon in an ele- uh, in an elevator today. He goes, "Who's your draw?" And he goes, "Texas Tech." He goes, "I was so glad we didn't get have to play those guys." Uh, and he he knows right. And I'm not name dropping. I'm just saying. Obviously, everybody knows around the country how hard they play and how hard they are to score on and how disciplined they are. And so, um, you know, we're gonna have our work cut out for us, and it's gonna be a uh, it's gonna be a tight battle and. And you got to take advantage of opportunities when they arise. All right, Bennett. Hey, Coach. Bennett Conlon with the Daily Progress in Charlottesville, Virginia. Wanted to ask about Marco Anthony, what kind of lift he's given you guys this year on the court, but then also uh, as a leader for you. Marco has been tremendous. Uh, I mean, and I'd tell you if he wasn't, he has been unbelievable for us. You know, he came in. We recruited him out of high school when we were at South Dakota. Um, a little while and built a little bit of a relationship with them, went down and watched them play in an AU event. I told our assistant, Eric Peterson, who was the lead recruiter on him, like there, we have no chance of getting this kid, you know, to South Dakota. And, um, and shortly thereafter, Virginia offered him. And, um, and then I think the, the guy that was the lead recruiter for them, for Marco, uh, got a different job that summer. Anyway, long and the short of it, he had a great experience at Virginia but was just looking for something different when he hit the, when he hit the transfer portal portal, we were um, all over him right away. He's a great person. He's been a great leader. He's got a great voice. He's really intelligent. 
Um, the guy, everybody on the team respects him um, for a multi because of his character. Um, he knows how to win and he's a really good player. So he's a bit of a Swiss army knife. You know, he's a legit six, five. When he first came to Utah state, he was 230 pounds. Now he's about 218. So he's really carved up. He's a big body. And he's a guy that can play a lot of different spots on the floor. We can play him. We played him at point guard and we've had him play the four for us and everything in between. Certainly most of his time, he's at a wing. Um, he's a guy that typically guards the other team's best perimeter player. He's first team all league defensive player um, in the Mountain West. And, um, and he, he's a stat stuffer. You know, he can score it. His shot looks a little funky, but it's effective. And we feel very confident with him shooting the ball. Um, he's, a, he's a good passer. I think he's taken that to a different level here the last month or so. Um, what was it? The first game of the conference tournament. I think he had eight assists and, um, and he's a good rebounder. You know, what do you have? Six offensive rebounds. I think one of the games here recently. So, um, he's a dynamic player in a guy that's a do it all type of guy. And, and, you know, if he wants, he'll have two years left and that's exciting because I think he's just scratching the surface of how good he truly can become. And like you asked, Bennett, he's had a great voice. He's been a guy that's been such a role model for our, you know, we have seven freshmen or six fresh, seven freshmen in our program, counting Liam McChesney, who, re, who redshirted last year. He broke his leg. Otherwise, he'd be playing for us. But um, uh, he's been a great mentor and a guy that those young guys really look up to. He's got a great voice for us. All right, Carlos. Hey, Coach Carlos Silva from the Lubbock Avalanche Journal. You've already spoken about the challenge of trying to score on Texas Tech defense, but they obviously have to try and score on your defense, which is pretty good this year. Can you just speak to their guard, specifically Mac McClung, and what he's been able to do in terms of just making them successful on that on that yeah. basketball? Yeah, Carlos, thanks for the question. Um, we've had a really – I mean, obviously this year we've taken it to a different level, but we've been a one of the top defensive teams over the last couple years, um, well, over the last three years in the country, and – um, you know, for a lot of reasons, we do it differently than, than Texas Tech, uh, but, but we're effective, effective nonetheless. And, and uh, McClung is, a, he's a spark plug for him. He's, a, he's got flair to his game, as you guys know, and he can really get it going in bunches. Um, he's not afraid of the moment. And he's hit some big shots for them, of course, um, throughout the year. But he plays with high energy and high pace, and he's fearless in what he does. And, you know, he can shoot the three. He's got an excellent pull-up game. And obviously you can get to the rim and make plays for, um, for anybody. But he just, the thing that stands out to me is he just always plays on attack. Like he's just always on attack, you know? And so you got to really be on point with him because he just doesn't take any plays off. And so when you relax, he's, I mean, he's just coming at you, you know, and the Shannon junior kid, I mean, that guy, does so many things and he's so versatile. You can play him all over the floor. And, you know, when you watch Texas tech play, you're kind of like, and, and we're pretty big in positionless basketball. You know, I don't, we, you know, we have a point guard, but we have a multitude of point guards and Texas tech is kind of the same. It's like, well, who's their point guard in this lineup? Who's their four man. They're just so versatile, you know, one through four and they can play a, dot, a lot of different lineups, but Shannon's an electric player. Um, he's so athletic, uh, and strong and, and he shoots the three and he's got the pull-up game. He can get to the offensive glass. I mean, he just does everything. He's so dynamic, um, that way. So, um, you know, and then, uh, Edwards is shooting it at a high, high level and, um, and can do a lot of things again, he position versus, I mean, he just brings him so much versatility, you can play him at the one, two or the three. And um, when you make a mistake on him, he, he usually makes you pay. So they have a lot of versatility, but yet their coaching staff has done a really good job of um, they're all so different. So it, it works really well where they can blend together and they all feed off each other. And then they bring, you know, those other guys off the bench that are dynamic as well. Um, so you just got to really be on point with them. Okay, Ajay. Hey, Coach. Uh, hey, Ajay, can you finish that book yet? 
Uh, I'm at page 350, so I'm just over halfway there. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a good book. Uh, Chris Beard uh, was very complimentary about you as a coach. He considers you a friend within the business. Wonder if you can talk about him, your relationship with him. And uh, I, I don't know how parallel your careers are with each other, but he, he, he thinks the world of you and wonder what your thoughts are on him. Well, Chris obviously has an amazing track record. He's done it everywhere he's been. Um, he's a basketball guy through and through. He's a junkie. That's easy to see. It's easy to see from a distance. It's also easy to feel, right? When you watch an interview or you see his teams play, like you you feel that energy and that passion. And, um, you know, it's really interesting. He's a guy I've always looked to. Uh, their teams – I've followed from a distance specifically since Matt has been back, but two things with him um, or specifically when Matt went, Matt Mooney went to Texas tech. So a lot of people know the Matt Mooney story, you know, Matt went to had one scholarship offer out of high school, went to air force Academy, was there two years, one year as a prep school cadet, and then played about 18 minutes as a freshman. He had a lot of offers and looks. He came to us at South Dakota, um, he had a great, you know, red shirt. It really improved his red shirt year. Had a really good sophomore and junior year. First time all league guy. Uh, we got hired at Utah State. Obviously, we tried like crazy to get him. That would have been a heck of a backcourt with Mooney and, and Sam Merrill. But he thought we were going to be rebuilding like everybody did. You know, we were picked ninth in that preseason. And he wanted to go to a place where he felt like he could play at the highest level, play for a really good coach. And, um, and playing the NCAA tournament. Like Matt made a comment to me at South Dakota. I'll never, I don't know if I'll ever be able to live with myself if I can't play in an NCAA tournament. And which might sound a little like, but that's Matt. And, and he went to Texas Tech and I asked him after, why'd you choose Texas Tech? He goes, coach, honestly, Chris Beard reminds me a lot of you. Um, just with your personality and your passion and so on and so forth. And I was like, come on, Matt, why'd you really go? He goes, no, like that was a huge reason. And Chris would call um, the various states, tell me about Matt, tell me about Matt. And then once they already had Matt, hey, tell me more about Matt. And we're having a hard time with him with this. Or what are some sets that you ran that you really liked for Matt? You know, and, and I give Chris a lot of credit. They already had Matt. And he would still call just to, to make their team better or to help Matt become better. And um, so that was really cool. And obviously it was at the national, at the final four and watched them play. And, and, um, and then another quick story when, when coach Beard was an assistant at Texas tech with Pat Knight, they recruited a guy named Taran Petaway and, and Taran committed to Texas tech. I was at Colorado state. And we had recruited Taran for two years, got to know their, I, was, I had spent more time in Galveston, Texas with Taran and his family and Mike Evans, who made an official, Mike Evans, the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receiver, he made an official visit for basketball to us. And he went to Texas Tech and then they were let go. And, um, and they hired Billy Gillespie and Taran honored that commitment, but it just didn't work out the way he had hoped. And Taran transferred, to, his dad called and said, hey, Taran's, transferring would you guys take him at nebraska that i went from colorado state to nebraska in that year and talked to coach miles and we were like absolutely we we brought taran in and uh getting to know you know trans taran trans father terry trans mother joetta has since passed away had always said you and chris beard are remind me that he always said you remind me of chris beard and so i'm not trying to be my own that's them talking that's not me talking but it's interesting, the six degrees of separation and how it kind of came full circle a little bit um, um, from that respect. So I remember, and I don't know if Chris remembers this or not, but I had just gotten hired at the, as the head coach at South Dakota. And Chris was, I believe, a junior college head coach, or maybe it was at Angela State. I don't remember which one, but we were staying in the same hotel in Dallas at the Final Four. And we crossed each other in the parking lot. And Chris literally said, hey, are you Craig Smith? And I'm like, yep. And I was just by myself. He goes, hey, uh, I think very highly of you. The Petaways loved you. And congrats on all your success, your team's success at Nebraska. And congrats on getting the South Dakota job. And it's just funny how that 
that 45 minute, 45 second compliment or comment still resonates, you know, with me. I just remember that, that him just going out of his way to say that was a pretty cool thing. So um, always pulling for him, except against the Aggies, obviously uh, he does a heck of a job and, and just treats people the right way in every way, shape and form. Thanks coach. Okay. We've got three more. So uh, Al and then Mitch, and then we'll finish up with Alex. So, uh, coach, I was going to ask you about all of their personnel. You did that. So how do they match up, do you think, with Nimi? How do they take care of Nimi in this game? Well, they'll do it, I think, a lot of different ways. You know, obviously, they don't, they're don't. they very athletic. Silva, the Silva kid, uh, we were prepared. You know, we, we played VCU um, the first game of the year. So getting ready for VCU, I saw a lot of film on him. And so when I started watching Texas Tech, I always, I don't look at their roster right away. I just watch film. I want to formulate my own opinion on our opponent first, but I kept looking at this kid like, I know who that kid is. And uh, and then when I saw he was a VCU transfer, I was like, that's where I knew him. But, you know, him and PV and um, Tyreek Smith, and they'll throw a lot of different guys at him, but, you know, they, they'll double the post. And I'm guessing, I don't know that and force them to the baseline, which we've seen a lot this year. I mean, we've seen about every kind of double team imaginable. Um, you know, Nimi's a legit 6'11". Um, you know, obviously their centers are not quite that size in terms of height, uh, but they just do it differently. They're going to bring, I'm guessing they're going to bring some pressure to him and make him play in a double or maybe even a triple team, who knows? Or they might just say, you know what, we're going to play him one-on-one. Um, but they do a lot of different things. You know, like I said at the top, um, they're not afraid to switch one through five ball screens. They're not afraid to switch one through five down screens, flare screens, anything of the sort. So they're well-trained. They're used to playing against big guys in the Big 12 all the time. And um, and they'll do it um, in different layers, so to speak, with different doubles and different guys um, rotating on them. Coach, uh, what lessons or, or self evals have you personally learned from your program's experience to, in this tournament two years ago that you feel will maybe put your team in a better position for success this time around? Well, you know what, Mitch, I think the biggest thing is, and we only have four guys that played in this tournament, but it's become the expectation. You know, that first year, um, that was our goal. Not only, to, and our goal every year is get to the NCAA tournament and win when we get there. Right, that's the goal. Get to the NCAA tournament and win when we get there. And we've been steadfast with that message from the day we got hired almost three years ago, March 28th of um, 2018, I think. <laughs> um, but that we've been steadfast with that, um, you know, and we've been able to do it for three straight years. But obviously, because of last year's pandemic, this is only the second year playing. But that's become the expectation. That's what we recruit to. That's what we talk about. It's not just, and it's not, now we don't just talk about it. We, we do it. And so our guys expect to be here um, and, and are, ex are excited to be here. And that's the standard of Utah State basketball. All right, Alex, do you want to finish this out? I would love to. Hello, Craig. How hey, are you? Hey, Alex. Um, but before I ask my question, I just wanted to say that I thought I think it's kind of cool that uh, that your mom is is helping do some cooking at your old high school. Uh, I heard that yesterday, so that was a nice little story. Um, <laughs> she loves to cook. I always <laughs> tell her, "Mom, you retired four or five years ago. Like, why do you? Well, I can't go here because I'm working. I can't go. I was like, you're retired. I think she works more now. Well, she does it work more now than she used to. But anyway, yeah." Uh, you know, in terms of in terms of matchups and, and basketball games and things like that, I think everybody can talk and ask ad nauseum about what's this matchup here, defense, offense. Um, but a lot of times these types of games come down to who wants it more. So, like, how do you measure that or during a game or, or before a game? Like, how, do, how can you measure if the Aggies want it more? Well, I know we're going to want it badly, and I know they're going to want it badly, and I think that's the the DNA of both programs. You know, we talk, obviously, at Utah State about a Gata mentality, get after their, you know what, uh, and I would say they have the same type of mentality. I mean, just 
uh, you are what you emphasize. And, and I think there's a lot of the same emphasis on both teams. Now it becomes who's quicker to the ball, right? Who's more instinctive to the ball? Who's the most disciplined team? And then just who can make the most plays? You know, I know both teams are chomping at the bit. Texas Tech hasn't played for what it'll be probably eight days, I think, maybe something like that. And, and both teams are sitting in this bubble where you're, I mean, you know, it was quarantined until you get the second positive test, but you're, it's kind of become groundhog day a little bit where you're kind of doing the same old thing and you're all in your own room and you try to keep them occupied without being over the top. Um, but all the anticipation, the excitement, obviously it's tipping off tonight with those two games and there's going to be tremendous enthusiasm and excitement. I know we're ready to play. I know they're going to be ready to play. And then it comes down to execution and being sound and being fundamental and then finding a way to, to finish plays and not to, you're right. Al, we told our guys at the end of practice, like, I know we're ready, but now you got to execute, right? I, I know they're going to be ready and they got to execute and you just got to play with tremendous ferocity and, um, in determination and they're going to make some runs and we're going to make some runs, but you just got to be able to stay the course. And, and then like we say at the end, you just got to find a way to win. Coach, if you humor me, I had uh, four questions that were emailed in, which I think would be beneficial for the group. Okay. Um, so uh, Carl Carlos is over there getting impatient with me already. Like, does this guy ever shut up? <laughs> <laughs> So both teams are defensive minded. Is it easier or more difficult to prepare for a team with a similar style of play? That's a great question. Um, uh, probably harder. I mean, that's a, that, I can see both sides of it, cause, but I, these guys are hard. I mean, you just, you just, you sit there and, hey, can we get them here? Can we get them here? Can we get it? How can we attack them? Can we get them with? this kind of screen and roll action. How can we get them in the post? Where can we get them with the end? There's just not a whole lot of holes, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just, uh, and so you just sit there and and you just got to take advantage of those opportunities when you get them, you know? And and it's, it's and the reason I say it's harder, we, we hang our hat on defense. We know ch defense travels. So that's our philosophy. Uh, obviously we can, we, we have proven we can score too, but, when you're elite defensively, man, it's it, it makes life really, really difficult. Um, the next question was uh, Tech's pretty balanced offensively, although led by Mac McClung. Um, is there a comparison within the Mountain West um, in how Texas Tech runs their offense? Um, is, the, is the question, is there a comparison of how they run their offense or a comparison of McClung? Uh, how they run their offense. It's okay. What kind of adjustments would yeah. you have to make against their offense? And well, who would you compare them to? Honestly, uh, we compare them to us on the offensive end. Um, they're very balanced. You have four guys that are at 10 points or higher on the year. We're very balanced um, as a team. You know, it's not uncommon for us to have five guys in double digits. That's happened, you know, four to five. That's happened many, many times throughout the year. Um, I would say we're a hybrid offensively. We have a few more play. Uh, we have more sets than them, but the way they play um, is very free. And I would say we're a, a hybrid of motion offense and dribble drive. And I would use the same comparison to them. They're probably a little more motion than we are, but, but still a lot of similarities like that. They're going to run plenty of balls, random ball screens within their motion they're going to throw it inside within their motion. Um, they'd set a lot of down screens. They set some flare screens. Um, they're active cutters away from the ball. And so I would compare them in our conference on the offensive end to us, um, to be quite frank. Um, you know, he's a Bobby, uh, uh, he's on the Bobby Knight coaching tree, Pat Knight coaching tree. And, and, and that's obviously what he's very much known for. So, um, you know, I think we go against that almost every day, well, daily in practice when we're practicing against ourselves. So I think there's a lot of similarities. Now, maybe maybe the personnel isn't exactly the same, right? Like, 
I mean, they have some higher level athletes up and down their lineup than we do, as you would expect. And so, but when it comes to just sheer style of play, I'd compare them to us. Perfect. Okay. This last one is specifically about Namish. Um, so his points, I mean, he's known for his defensive prowess, but his points per game have increased by around two points each season. So what has impressed you the most about that offensive development? Well, he just, he loves to be in the gym. He works hard at it. Um, certainly this year, he's been more of a primary scorer for us. And, um, and so he's gotten more touches down there. Um, you know, last year he was, as a sophomore, he was negotiating his injury and just trying to survive, so to speak, to get through that injury. And as a freshman, he weighed 218 pounds, you know, at 6'11". And, and so he didn't always have the, he didn't have the girth to just consistently get in there and bang with the big boys, you know, and he didn't have the stamina to be able to play the minutes that he's playing right now. Um, and then, and then he's just, he's fine tuned his game. I mean, he's a, he, he's a very good finisher to both hands. Whereas a freshman, he wasn't, you know, he could finish with his right hand, but not nearly as consistent with his left hand. And he's just a better finisher now. And part of it's because his touch has really improved. But a lot of that too, is his strength. He just doesn't get bumped off his spot, you know, like he used to, he's able to get a deeper position. And we've all seen his touch has really improved over the course of this off season and even throughout the season. Um, you know, he's able to make 15 to 17 footers, knock on wood. He's been knocking down free throws at a, at a high rate, specifically the last two months of the season. Um, and his offensive rebounding has gotten much better. And I think a lot of that just his strength. So now you add two points a game, just on offensive boards, two to four points, you know, it all, it all starts adding up um, quickly. And I'd say he's even become a better scorer here in the last six weeks or so. So when you add that all in, and there's a reason he stayed here all summer, you know, and didn't go back to Portugal at all, but he's really rounded out his game um, in a major way. Perfect. Okay, anything you would like to add before we wrap up? I don't have anything if you guys don't. Yeah, we'll, we'll wrap it up with that then. So thank you all for your time. Really appreciate the coverage and go Aggies. Thank you guys for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Go Aggies. Coach. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, fellas.